warning that signal an impending global recession measured as two consecutive quarters of contraction are blaring around the world as we speak. If you think that the you know, normal chance of recession is one in five, it's probably double that right now. I don't see a recession. I mean, the world is in a recession right now. And uh, although that's too big a statement, but if you look at China, China's doing very, very poorly. The famine which confronted the Lydians was of an ordinary and humble type. It followed a logic not beyond that of the clash between nature and human need. The crops did not grow upon desolate earth, and so pain came to hunt ancient stomachs. There was nothing that could change the matter but the return of fertility to air and to soil. The famine that we today face is not of this type. It is of a particular historical composition. Its most crucial feature is that it is wholly due to our social organisation. The world order of tomorrow is not a world order based on nation states or countries, it's a world order that is based on empire. Capital is not money, property or land. It is a relationship between the capitalist owners of these resources, the means of production, and the working class, who sell their ability to work for wages. The productive process cannot be completed without the workers, without which no commodities would be produced. As Marx says, labour is the source of all value. The problem of crisis evolves from the contradiction between this reality and capitalist investments need to reproduce itself on an ever-increasing scale to remain competitive. As a greater and greater portion of investment is taken up by machines and technology which augment productivity, the proportion allocated to productive capital or human labour power decreases. Correspondingly, as techniques are adopted across an industry, the ratio of profit relative to investment decreases. Investments appear unattractive and money is hoarded, producing a breakdown in the productive process. As Marx sees it, and the Polish Marxist Heinrich Grossmann further demonstrated, this process is absolute. And whilst investment may again be stimulated by the mass devaluation created by for example, the world wars, even these grandiose measures are but temporary. The rate of profit tends irrevocably toward zero. The productive forces capital creates provide the historical motor by which it abolishes its own rule. Today, Marx's predictions and Grossman's clarifications are clear as observable historical fact. The rate of profit has fallen, absolutely, on a world historic scale, from around 43% in the 1870s to 17% in the 2000s. It is on course to hit zero by 2050, assuming present trends of development. In consequence, over-accumulation that is, money hoarding due to a lack of sufficiently profitable investment opportunities is already at an all-time high, with world debt and speculative investment at record levels. The promise of capital's utopians, largely concentrated in the ascendant sectors of the tech industry, is that automation will replace work and usher in a new age of abundance. They leave out, of course, that at the same time this promise is delivered, they buy bunkers, debate whether it might be useful to use shock collars on their guards when money loses all value. 
and speak in hushed tones about what is known as the event. What the event might be, none will say with certainty. But there are clear options. Either a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large, or the common ruin of the contending classes. This latter option is today quite clear. It even comes in shades. On the one hand, a clear and increasingly volatile descent to world conflict, with chaos in the relations of every major global power and an open drift to a renewed age of imperialist war. On the other, the onset of the sixth mass extinction, which may only be resolved by a complete overhaul of humanity's conditions of existence. The final crisis is here. It puts humanity at a crossroads for capitalism and the end of humanity, or for socialism and an age of abundance. Now truly in reach. And it is in this context that something singular has happened. The whole of the bourgeois world, drowned in its own culture of propaganda, this has taken leave of reality. Kipper. And he was saying that China has total respect for Donald Trump and for Donald Trump's very, very large uh, brain. And so we become eternal. But unfortunately, crimes and wars will multiply. I love football. For good. I'm, I'm, I mean, everyone keeps trying to tell me, don't say it's forever. But I've spent 37 years pretending to be people so that people can pretend to watch and enjoy what I'm doing. This is to say that the fundamental premises of the postmodern era have run out. History is back, and nature appears to increasingly resemble an army. Economically, the period of neoliberal globalization, over which postmodernity attains dominance, is collapsing into a contest of empires. Not being a passing fad, but the cultural life of decades, this is not a trifle. What follows from the end of postmodernity's historical premises as the dominant ideological and cultural outlook of the imperialist counter-revolution is nothing short of a complete ideological crisis of bourgeois civilization now that this counter-revolution is coming to a culminatory historical juncture. Whilst any investigation of this ideological crisis cannot linger too long upon this fact, it must be understood as the fundamental historical motor behind our age, expressed ideologically as the period of postmodernity's ending. It must be borne in mind at all turns as we investigate the other material causes and ideological symptoms behind our moment of cultural transformation. of a wildebeest getting killed by lions made me feel sad for the wildebeest. So, I used computers to turn the wildebeest into a Nazi. Now I'm glad that it's dead.